Okay, I hope you're not too tired. <laughs> too many things this morning, a lot of knowledge. And uh, I'm going to try to switch on uh, the time uh, we have. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, Luis and uh, colleagues in my our department to invite you here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit what I have been researching right now. Uh, my research is on uh, mm, political advertising. And I'm particularly interested on how these specific new marketing trends are being incorporated into political marketing theory. So what I've been now following is these different trends of our political uh, marketing in general, like for peace and to relational marketing, to experiential marketing, to uh, gamification, and this is something I've been researching, and how all of this has been adapted into the political field <coughs> since uh, politicians as, as brands, I don't have any problem in talking about politicians connected to branding and uh, as products and campaigns, uh, and how they have been incorporating, following this idea that they need to uh, improve the communication they have with the voters. So uh, what I've been doing, uh, I'm not going to go into that, uh, my focus has especially been on content, uh, on uh, these are some of the tools that we're using, these are visual scenarios analyzing what kind of images they are using and what kind of stories they are building to uh, engage with uh, the voters, the consumers, the citizens. And my particular interest is on structures. I'm particularly interested on the structure of communication, the structure of messages, since I think that they are very meaningful containers. They, uh, we can talk as formats, the different formats of communication, because I'm um, convinced that these formats do have a, a very strong impact on what kind of messages can be communicated and what kind of ideologies are being transmitted beyond the specific message. Because it is not the same to communicate through uh, television uh, uh, news than to communicate in a television show, than in Twitter, than in Facebook, than in a website. So I'm particularly interested on uh, analyzing uh, this visual and the stories, but my interest is how the structure, what's the influence that the structure has in defining the political content. So I'm also <laughs> very interested in these two dynamics, and I'm going to try to explain very briefly uh, these two dynamics. I'm particularly interested in what happens when politics goes popular. What do I mean with this? I mean the idea that what, what is politics, what are political parties doing to get popular, to be, uh, to, mm, just to, to, to make people feel like they are not such disgusting people that we usually feel they have. So what are the strategies that they are doing to just mm, trying to be nicer for us? And what happens when the popular is going politics? Because here we've been observing a very interesting thing, and now I'm talking here in Catalonia, we have had these very, two very interesting case, cases, not only about the uh, independentist <coughs> movement, which is a popular movement that has gone into politics, but also with uh, the mayor of Barcelona, something that happened also in Madrid with these two uh, women that were not into politics, they were into social movements, but they decided to go into politics, and what kind of messages they have been constructing, but again, my focus is on what is the structure of the messages and whether they, they are uh, influenced, what's, kind, what's the kind of impact they have in the messages. So, uh, when politics goes popular, this is something that, this is not something that's new, and uh, this is something that dates back from, uh, I would say the 70s and the 80s, but uh, I don't want to, uh, go further on that, I just wanted to show you something. This idea of uh, marketing, uh, when uh, marketing researchers started, they realized that they needed to uh, move beyond the four P's and they said, okay, we need to create a relational marketing, we want to engage with our consumers, we need to engage with them, so we need to start as a conversation with them, we need to start as a relationship with them. So what do they do? They started this movement of, uh, um, I name it to colonize daily life. They started to use uh, the issues, the topics, the language that people were concerned about. And uh, one of the things they were mostly engaged with was, was the idea of diversity. I was uh, 
racial diversity, the gender diversity, all this diversity that were, uh, was uh, being used by these uh, campaigns. This is a top-down uh, use of diversity that I will compare with these bottom-up campaigns. And this is something that dates back from, you know, all these Benetton ads with uh, using diversity, this uh, uh, racial diversity and uh, all these taken for granted things that we assume with all these kind of images and they're playing with this racial diversity, uh, family diversity and even with uh, LGTB that they're playing with diversity in all these different ways and uh, this is a dog um, campaign also uh, playing a different sense of diversity like these different ways of uh, um, talk about the beauty and the real beauty etc etc and again this diversity and all this of course, uh, many brands are using this diversity in different ways, but as um, I think you were mentioning uh, uh, Naomi Klein this morning, and uh, she was, she's explaining this idea as a failure of a uh, popular movement because even if at that moment that seemed to be something very successful because these brands uh, really achieved, they really got uh, the conversation about diversity into the public sphere. So that seemed something to celebrate. So some of these uh, naive uh, uh, movements, they might have thought, okay, this is great. Capitalism, patriarchy is taking all these images with us. So now we might be closer to a uh, far uh, better world or we might be incorporating all these differences. So that would be something great. But of course that was not the case. That was a failure. Why? Because uh, Naomi Klein was saying, was that was a, on a simply, if you allow me this, that was simply a superficial use of the images. They were not, and this is her sentence, they were not political enough. They were only taking the images of diversity, but they were not going into the real vindication or the, the real vindication <coughs> about uh, all these diversity movements. So the same thing happened with political branding. And I'm going to just show you some images. I'm not going to go up because I, I'm afraid I don't have the time, but the campaign of Bernie Sanders, he played this diversity idea. And he had very powerful uh, advertising slots with uh, uh, this uh, um, diversity of gender, of age, of race, of uh, all these different images of diversity. Even Hillary Clinton, she played this idea. Of course, that was not believable at all, and nobody believed that. Because at the time when they had to propose real policies to make this diversity effective, they did not propose that. Even Bernie Sanders, when he was asked on television, would you play a specific homage to these people? And he said, no, this is not time. It's no longer the time to make homage. It's not time to do that. You need to go further than that. But of course, that is important. So even Hillary Clinton, she has all these special uh, ads, uh, television ads in which she claims to play diversity of uh, all these, uh, the, the marriage of uh, gay people, and she was playing this in the eye. And then uh, she was also uh, doing some interesting ads about uh, how to, um, to come to react with uh, Donald Trump's specific statements about women. I don't know if you remember all of those uh, <coughs> polemics about uh, Donald Trump. And uh, uh, now he claim was uh, she is uh, she's, uh, talking about that time about uh, the grabber in chief. So referring to Donald Trump's campaign. So uh, of course, again, that was not again, was not believable, so they both failed. So they were following this idea of this uh, top-down policy of uh, marketing, saying, okay, you need to engage with your consumers by using some of the consumers' uh, concerns, but it doesn't work if you are only taking these superficial images. So what happens when, at the contrary, when we go but, uh, and to examine what about politics and when popular comes by? And here I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna explain that because Carlos has already mentioned it, but this a specific thing about the transmedia storytelling is of course not only a story told across multiple media, but this idea of fandom that Carlos was talking about, this idea that uh, how can we engage consumers so that they can participate with this. So here I I have um, I've done this very uh, 
this, uh, I just want to mention these two very small researches about uh, two of um, things that can give us a lot of information and ideas that we can uh, carry on our research about this. And uh, this is uh, the first one, as I said before, is a Barcelona mayor campaign. Uh, she was an activist. <coughs> She's the actual mayor of Barcelona. She was an activist and she was against that. Uh, she was fighting uh, all these people that were uh, taken out of their houses because they couldn't pay the, the mortgages. So she decided to go into politics. And then she went into all these different sources of, of uh, entertainment uh, media. She went to all these different programs on television. She was crying on television. Uh, uh, this is a, 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 it's not, not a documentary. She's a, he's a very uh, known journalist in, a, in Catalan television. And she was playing all the different things she had to do. She was even playing guitar. She was singing. And she was doing all this kind of thing that from this notion of uh, what a celebrity politician would do. But she was using all this kind of stuff. But how was she doing it? They had this uh, movement of graphic liberation of Barcelona. This was very interesting because this is uh, an association of designers. They were uh, working all together in uh, Ada Colau's campaign. And uh, Carmela Marchena, she's at the, the uh, mayor of Madrid, and they decided to make a different kind of advertising for her. So, um, only just, I, I just want to give you this data that uh, on the, only for the online campaign of Aracolao, she had 400 people working for her 24 hours a day during the whole campaign, and they were following on Twitter and Facebook, we have Ada Colau in this program, we need to go into her, and they were very agile working uh, on her campaign. So have a look at the kind of images they were doing. Uh, they were using things from popular culture, they were using all these images about that. Of course, you recognize this is a massacre, Zedek, and all these uh, different uh, images from uh, popular culture. And for instance, this idea of transparency that was mentioned before, but I think also you, you mentioned it. But have a look how different it looks, this idea of transparency. They were using <coughs> all these visual metaphors to say, OK, we're transparent. This is uh, the facade of uh, the, uh, the building of uh, the Barcelona local government. OK, thank you. And this is what the, the way they have been uh, campaigning. As, uh, using the example of Barcelona is not on sale, and they, they were very creative with all these images. The second research I, I carried and that was very interesting to me was about uh, these uh, application games that were created <coughs> again from uh, individual, anonymous individuals that created this kind of application games. They were talking about uh, politicians in Spain. They were talking about corruption of Partido Popular. They were talking about evading money. They were talking about people that are actually in jail. And they were giving money to all these different people, to all these different politicians. What was very interesting to me, and this is something uh, that gave me really the key, was uh, how these different games were designing the role of the player. So when we are playing with this, and this is something that I'm immediately connecting with, this idea of a transmedia politics, how am I creating some contents? And again, with my focus on structure, the idea of interest for me is how these uh, games, these different platforms, are thinking about what do I want the consumer to do? What I'm asking the consumer to do? What I'm inviting the consumer, the viewer, the citizen to do? Because that is politics. <coughs> <clears throat> and my specific concern is about that. So here you have uh, some of these. Uh, for instance, this was the only thing, uh, something very interesting about this uh, research, was that um, in all the games except for one, I'm talking about, OK, run. <laughs> uh, all, uh, all the games, 44 games that I found in, during three years, there was only one in which the role of the gamer was to fight against the corrupt politician. All the rest of the games were helping the politician to be more corrupt, to steal more money. So this is giving us a lot of information about what we are asking the public to do. So that gave me a very interesting uh, light about 
this hypothesis about uh, how transmedia advertising uh, could be, uh, of course, potentially cheaper way to campaign, but also how, what kind of visual and narrative structures are being designed to be either completed or expanded or compressed in political campaigning. Because if transmedia is about, I am creating something, but I want your participation, I am defining what kind of participation I want you to have in my campaign. So this is politics. And I'm particularly interested in for next election we're going to have next year, what kind of participation of these different political brands are inviting us to uh, have in their campaigns. So that was it. Thank you very much.